February when the Supreme Court mulled over whether he should be permitted onto the Colorado ballot or not. So he made the determination to stay in West Palm Beach at his Mar-a-Lago uh, uh, state on that day here. Uh, for Donald Trump, I, I think that this is real. And I think it's notable that his attorney, Todd Blanche, who has been uh, 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 very defiant every time that he has spoken here today, he said, quote, uh, when talking about this, that they do not believe that they even should even be here today, to which Judge Marshall pushed back and saying, quote, you don't believe you should be here right now? in an incredulous way. So uh, this is the very judge that could determine the sentence and one for Donald Trump, uh, in which he, of course, wants to be on the campaign trail, wants to be doing anything other but this. But he's looking at several long days ahead for himself over the course of six to eight weeks. I mean, Vaughn, this is where these two realities collide, right? From standing in front of supporters who will believe that there are 42,000 people in their midst when there are actually five, to standing before a judge who says, N no, you can't skip out to go to the Supreme Court arguments, you know, to your point, he, I'm sure the judge has access to the information that he wasn't at the last one. Um, this is the rare arena in which Donald Trump is not in charge of his own fate. He's not in charge of his schedule. He's not in charge of when he gets to eat. He's not in charge of when he gets to go. He's not in charge of when he gets to come. The schedule is set by the judge. The rules are set by the right. judge. And he is in, in some ways like any other criminal defendant in these windows of time. This isn't politics. You know, you can't Chris, uh, convince Chris Sununu, uh, despite Chris Sununu's <laughs> past uh, <laughs> outspoken <laughs> statements of you. Uh, you know, you can't convince him to vote for you in November, right? This isn't sort of the wielding power. He has no cabinet positions to offer the jurors. Right. He doesn't have the vice presidency to offer. He doesn't have the power of social media to go and attack somebody like a Kim Reynolds or a Ron DeSantis. You know, that's the difference. These jurors, they are normal human beings who live normal lives here in New York. And so for Donald Trump, you know, he was able to wield his power through his business ventures, you know, which Suzanne has chronicled over these decades in which he was able to rise to real estate uh, magnet, right? And have a TV show, right? L largely out of really defining who he was. But at this point in time inside of the courtroom, it's unlike anything he's ever done before, because unlike on that campaign stage in front of those several thousand folks in central Pennsylvania, it's not him who gets to write his story. It's the evidence. Mm -hmm. It is those who were closest to him, Hope Hicks. Yeah. You know, it is Michael Cohen who worked side by side before flipping on him. They, the documents, are going to be the ones telling his story. The prosecutors are going to be telling his story. And Donald, choice has no, has, Donald Trump has no choice but to, the, to sit there and acknowledge that the jurors who hold his fate are going to be the ones to make that determination. Not him and not any of those who he can offer a better political plus job to sometime down the line in the future. So, Harry. The Trump legal team has filed a new brief today ahead of next week's oral arguments in the Supreme Court that's on the 25th of April, in which he is claiming that Ford's, President Ford's pardon of President Nixon, which, as you recall, Michael Beschloss and John Meacham were talking about earlier in our program today, supports Trump's argument that ex-presidents should be immune for any office-related acts unless impeached and convicted. Quote, it says the respondent argues that DOJ's admission that the prosecution of a president is necessarily political applies only to sitting presidents, and politicization vanishes once the president leaves office, in light of not one but four hyper-politicized prosecutions pending against President Trump. In addition to politically motivated civil cases, this argument cannot be taken seriously. It also contradicts President Ford's pardon statement on President Nixon. Now, I'm not a lawyer, Ali, but I remember this is, to me, President Ford pardoned Richard Nixon because he wanted to avoid a prosecution for an ex-president that would take place after the president had resigned in disgrace to avoid uh, conviction on his impeachment. Exactly. Le let's remember that the former president's team has lost every round on this Peace. The question not of whether he's guilty, but whether he can, in fact, as a citizen, be charged. And everyone knows he can, and that's the history, and that's the precedent. And the Ford pardon goes the other way. The whole reason, as you mentioned, that Nixon needed and accepted uh, what was a controversial pardon was that otherwise he could be prosecuted. He worried about going to bed in a prison cell. He mused about that, and he took the pardon for that reason. This new claim uh, by the president and former president's lawyers is, is so weak 
It's such a bad legal argument that I would say it is, number one, embarrassing. Uh, although the lawyers may have been felt inclined they needed to make it because their client demanded it. Uh, but it's embarrassing, number one, and two, it's probably counterproductive. I don't think it's the kind of argument that will appeal to the Supreme Court. It almost uh, projects a, a bit of a circus-like upside-down Alice in Wonderland quality. And let's also remember this is the same case where Trump's lawyers also claimed a kind of license to kill. Uh, that a president could theoretically assassinate Americans, innocent American opponents, politically, uh, and never be held accountable for it. Uh, these aren't just bad arguments. They're likely to backfire in oral argument at the Supreme Court. This is right now leaving the courthouse, so we're watching it very, very closely, Sarah. Uh, let's see what the president has to say. So thank you very much. Uh, we had some amazing things happen today. As you know, my son has graduated from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. He's very proud of the fact that he did so well. And I was looking forward for years to have graduation with his mother and father there. And it looks like the judge isn't going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. If you read all of the legal pundits, all of the legal scholars today, there's not one that I see that said this is a case that should be brought or tried. It's a scam. It's a political witch hunt. It continues, and it continues forever. And we're not going to be given a fair trial. It's a very, very sad thing. Let me dive back into the courtroom. Um, they are right now arguing over um, Donald Trump's team's failure to produce reciprocal discovery under New York law. The prosecution is arguing that they need those documents. They need that material. Um, they keep asking for it, and the prosecution or the defense has not given it over. The defense is saying... Uh, we've got so much documentation to go through ourselves. We don't have the um, manpower to do it that quickly. Mershon has ruled that the defense has 24 hours to hand this material over to the prosecution. And this is where it gets interesting. Donald Trump is now personally getting involved here. He's pushing Todd Blanche, his lawyer, to fight, to fight harder about uh, these documents and, and this compliance, saying that they need more time. Um, what do you make of Donald Trump getting into this, Catherine, like getting up and, and telling his or getting into his lawyer's face and telling him that he needs to fight harder? It's going to be a long trial for Mr. <laughs> Blanche and Ms. Nicholas uh, because he is out of control. He's one of those clients that you hope to not have because if he's acting this way now, he's going to do it throughout the trial. In terms of the reciprocal discovery, Prosecutors really have more of the burden in New York. Um, the, the fence are supposed to also turn things over, but the consequences for them not doing it are not as severe as it is for prosecutors. So this will not be a major issue. Donald Trump has been more active uh, with the defense team, his uh, lawyers, since they've been back from lunch, according to our reporters who are watching, chatting with both Blanche and Bove, another one of his lawyers. Um, our reporters have not seen him getting into such lengthy conversation with his attorneys like this so far today. Mershon is not talking, is now talking about waiting for the jurors while we wait for the jurors. Um, and then he's going on to discuss something else. So it seems like we are still waiting Ladies and gentlemen, there's also but this, issue, I was going to say there is also in New York, there's something called the Sandoval right. here. And that's always done before jury selection. And what that means is I'm sorry, I, I think of Tom Sandoval. Are we getting into Scandoval no, here in New York? It's people be Sandoval. <laughs> so when prosecutors are going to cross examine the defendant, assuming this defendant is going to testify before that, before jury selection, they have to let the defense and the court know what prior bad acts they intend to cross examine the defendant about. And then the judge does a hearing and says, you can cross about this, you can cross examine about that, but you can't cross examine about those things. So that hearing is typically done before jury selection. So and, they may be doing being, that now. It's being discussed now in terms of it, I believe, taking place tomorrow morning. Okay. And that's very significant because it's going to impact, number one, perhaps the order of witnesses that you call because it, it's how you lay your case out as well as the extent to the inf of the information that you actually ask about because you don't want to open the door to certain things. Um, and so this is a very significant thing. Catherine, I'm so glad you brought that up because it has a real impact in terms of how you plan around this trial. All right. Vaughn Hilliard, Michael Steele, thank you. Catherine Christian, Charles Coleman, you're going to stay with us much more. 
So folks, you saw there Donald Trump's conduct, whether it was him throwing a tantrum, as was noted by some of those hosts, basically demanding his lawyers act more crazy, more like maniacs than they already are, basically poking them, being like, be more insane. During this selection process, Donald Trump continues to insult and attack the jury by his actions, basically creating a scenario where people feel unsafe. Right. As some people have noted, uh, pe- jurors are trying to recuse themselves because some people honestly feel they couldn't give Donald Trump a fair trial. Either they're too pro Trump, they're too anti Trump. They don't feel they could. That's fair. Some people are bowing out because they, they're afraid of the environment Donald Trump has created for jurors and for everybody else. And you see in that clip there, Donald Trump coming out of the courtroom, he says to the world, the judge won't even let me miss court for Barron's graduation. But here's the deal. The jurors are expected to be there every day. I don't know what's going on with their life. They might have important meetings. They might have important appointments. The jury might have important family events and they'll miss those things because they do have to be there every day. So lo and behold, everybody gets to skip court. Uh, No one gets to skip court, but Donald insulting and attacking the jury thinks that he should be allowed to not be there while 12 regular working class people who are giving up their livelihoods and their time and their families for God knows who, how, how long they're expected an attacking insult from this orange monster.